What day is sacred to God? To be as clear as possible, I would like to begin by defining a term with roots in the 16th century, which is rarely used today. Salvific faith. I understand that salvific faith occurs when a person is prompted by the Holy Spirit to do something that is right and honorable in God's sight, even if the price for obedience is significant. Additionally, the person is willing to trust in God and obey the Holy Spirit's voice, leaving the consequences in God's hands. For example, God commanded Noah to build an ark, and the antediluvians ridiculed and scorned him for doing so. God commanded Abraham to leave his home and homeland, and he left not knowing where he was going. Nebuchadnezzar threw Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego into a fiery furnace because they believed the second commandment was obligatory and their faith caused them to defy the king's command to worship the golden image. These examples show that salvific faith is far more than intellectual assent. Salvific faith involves a price for obeying God. Hebrews 11 I believe the Ten Commandments are obligatory, and for me, they are a matter of salvific faith. I accept them, both in their spiritual and physical sense, as God's will. I have found, like Paul, I am unable to live in perfect compliance with them because my sinful nature rises up now and then and will not permit it. See Romans 7 and 8. Nevertheless, the Lord's law is perfect, and I love the covenant that the Ten Commandments represent. I eagerly look forward to the time when Jesus will remove my sinful nature and write his laws in my heart and mind. Then I will be able to live in perfect harmony with him and his perfect law forever. Until this transformation occurs, I live with this anticipation. Even though I have closely studied the Bible on this topic and am intellectually settled in the matter, I have to accept by faith and the Holy Spirit's conviction that the observance of the fourth commandment is God's will. Of course, I understand that most Christians do not share my conviction. They often excuse themselves from the obligation of the fourth commandment by saying, the Ten Commandments were abolished at the cross, or it doesn't matter which day I keep holy as long as I worship God, or I worship God every day. There is nothing in the Bible that forbids or requires worshiping God every day. However, there is a commandment that declares six days are secular and the seventh day of the week is holy. The Creator declares the seventh day is unlike the other six. The fourth commandment requires us to honor our Creator every Saturday by resting from work. Consider four theological concepts which work together in perfect harmony. Law, grace, faith, and obedience. These concepts do not cancel one another. God does not give with large print and then take away with fine print. The first concept in God's government is His law. No one, including God Himself, is above the law. This means no one can violate the law without incurring the penalty of the law. God established His law before grace, faith, and obedience became possible. Actually, God's law establishes the need for grace, faith, and obedience. King David understood the primacy of God's law. He wrote, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statues of the Lord are trustworthy, 
making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Psalms 19, verses 7 and 8. No individual can appreciate the depth of David's words unless the Holy Spirit opens that person's eyes and heart to understand them. Paul wrote, The man without the Spirit does not accept things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14 After the Apostle Paul encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, Paul understood that no man can achieve or produce the righteousness required for eternal life. He wrote, For in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith and from first to last, just as it is written, The righteous will live by faith. Romans 1.17 Paul also understood that salvation was only possible through God's amazing grace, his unmerited favor. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 2, 11 through 13. The Bible teaches that where there is no law, there is no sin, Romans 4, 15. This is common sense, because a person cannot violate a non-existing law. The Bible says that sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. And Paul says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 Therefore, if we are sinners, God's laws are present. Paul says that love is the fulfilling of the law. Romans 13.10 But he only realized this fact after he was born again. Prior to his conversion, Paul thought that perfect obedience was the fulfillment of the law, Philippians 3, 4-6. Jesus was asked, Which law is the greatest? And he responded, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets, a phrase used to describe the Old Testament when Jesus was on earth, hang on these two commandments. Matthew 22, 37 to 40. God's law is a covenant and a promise. The Ten Commandments are both a law and a promise. For the sinful nature, they are law. For the spiritual nature, they are a promise. God has promised to write His laws in our heart and minds at the appointed time, Jeremiah 31, 31, Hebrews 8, 10, and 11. The Ten Commandments are called a covenant in the Old Testament, Exodus 34, 28, Deuteronomy 4, 13, because they reveal what love will do. The first four commandments reveal what love for God produces, and the last six commandments reveal what love for our neighbors produce. When God's law is written in our hearts and minds, and the sinful nature is replaced with a sinless nature Jesus originally gave to Adam and Eve, our thoughts, words, and actions will be in perfect harmony with the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are so important that Jesus himself spoke them from Mount Sinai. Contrary to what many Protestants claim, all ten of them are reiterated in the New Testament. For example, 
Paul affirmed the perpetuity of the fourth commandment about 30 years after Jesus ascended, saying, There remains then a seventh-day Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his on the seventh day. Hebrews 4, 9 and 10. When Jesus died on the cross, God abolished the Levitical laws he gave to Israel. Colossians 2, 14 through 17. From the beginning, the Levitical laws included a sunset clause. When the Lamb of God died on the cross, the Levitical laws ended because God no longer required animal sacrifices. Many people think that animal sacrifices in the Old Testament actually brought salvation, but Paul says otherwise. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Hebrews 10.4 God required Israel to sacrifice bulls, goats, and lambs until Jesus died so Israel could study the plan of salvation and understand the reality of things to come. Colossians 2.17 God designed the ceremonial system which required animal sacrifices to serve as a carefully constructed drama. After Jesus died, there was no further need of it. The Levitical laws, which also separated Jews from Gentiles, were also abolished. Notice the wonderful result. But now, in Christ Jesus, you Gentiles, who were once far away from the truth and the joy of salvation, have been brought near through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two separate nations into one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the Levitical law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two separate nations, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you Gentiles, who were far away, and peace to those, the Jews, who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you Gentiles are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people, all who are led by the Spirit, and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. Ephesians 2 13 through 20. The Ten Commandments do not speak of eternal life because the purpose of the Ten Commandments is not salvation. God gave them to all mankind through Israel to define immorality. If a nation lives in harmony with the Ten Commandments, avoiding all forms of immoral conduct, everyone lives safely and happily. God also gave the Ten Commandments as a mirror so that we can compare our thoughts, words, and behavior with the intent of His laws. If we relate to God's laws properly, they become beneficial. We can see our shortcomings and realize our daily need for the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit to live better lives. James 1, 22 through 25 Finally, the Ten Commandments reveal what genuine love for God and neighbors will produce. No one who loves God will take his name in vain or worship an idol, and no one who loves his neighbor as himself will steal from him or commit murder. The Ten Commandments are the basis for the Golden Rule. Jesus said, So in everything do to others, what you would have them do to you, 
for this sums up the law and the prophets, the Old Testament. Matthew 7, 12. Children should also be taught the inverse of the golden rule. As you do unto others, God will do the same to you. Matthew 5, 25 and 26, Romans 12, 19, Hebrews 10, 30, and Revelation 2, 23. A Legalist When it comes to salvation, there are Old Testament legalists and New Testament legalists. An Old Testament legalist believes that he will be saved through perfect obedience to God's law. Paul was an Old Testament legalist before his conversion. So was the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, 17 to 23, who assumed that he was without fault in God's sight. New Testament legalists believe that they have been saved because they have done everything God requires for salvation, Romans 10.10. 10. Both forms of legalism are based on human effort or achievement, even though the theology, behaviors, and beliefs are poles apart. God's grace does not save us. Instead, His grace makes salvation possible. Millions of people, Revelation 20, verse 8, will not receive eternal life because they chose to reject God's grace and violate the voice of the Holy Spirit. Our response to the Holy Spirit determines our eternal destiny. This is where salvific faith comes into focus. If we follow the voice of the Holy Spirit, we will suffer persecution. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, 2 Timothy 3.12. Persecution is where salvific faith is tested. When the Father sees a king or a pauper living in faith, he covers that person's sins with Jesus' righteousness, the sinless life of Jesus, because Jesus produced the righteousness necessary for eternal life when he was on earth, Romans 1.17. If we allow the Holy Spirit to live in our hearts, we will share King David's desire. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Psalms 119, verse 174. Remember, God's law is a spiritual matter, Romans 7, 14. When we love our neighbor enough that we would not steal anything that belongs to him, the intent of the law is fulfilled. Similarly, God's Sabbath is not for Old or New Testament legalists. If the Holy Spirit does not lead a person into joyfully observing God's Seventh-day Sabbath, there is no point of observing it. People who walk with God love walking with God. The consequences of walking with God usually end in persecution because He leads us away from the love of this world. 1 John 2.15 why worship on Sunday? For the past 2,000 years, Christians have challenged the importance of God's seventh-day Sabbath with seven arguments purporting to make Sunday the Lord's Day. However, if we consider each argument on its merits, we come to the opposite conclusion. I believe the seven arguments used to exalt Sunday sacredness actually ruin the prospect of it. However, if each person has to look at the evidence and determine for himself whether or not the Bible actually supports the claim that God transferred the sacredness of his seventh-day Sabbath to the first day of the week, 